It was around 11 o'clock at night, and I was on my way to my very first shift at Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. I had recently been hired as a mechanical engineer, having previously worked at a car manufacturing company. I would never have left my previous job, but the entire business had gone bankrupt due to some kind of corruption among the higher-ups. My new role at Freddy Fazbear's consisted of maintaining the animatronics during the night so that they would be fully functional for the daytime masses. I was still a little worried because I didn't know how animatronics worked properly. The man from the job center who got me the position had assured me that my knowledge of cars would be more than enough to handle the task of keeping them maintained. I hoped he was right. As I pulled into the parking lot, my phone began vibrating in my pocket. I parked the car and answered the call, seeing that it was from my new boss. Hey there, son. I take it you've arrived by now, he said, and I confirmed that I had. He continued. I thought it was time I gave you a quick note about your job tonight. You see, the animatronics were built a very long time ago by the company's co-founder, and the spring locks inside their chests are incredibly dangerous and fragile. For your sake, please only work on the circuitry within their headpieces. That's all for now. Good luck. Before I could even respond, he hung up immediately after explaining what to look out for. It seemed odd that he'd tell me something so important so late. I thought about it for a moment soon realized I had better get started soon. I only had until 6 a.m. to get everything sorted for tomorrow. After getting out of my car, I went around to the trunk and reached inside to grab my toolbox. Once it was in my hands, I locked the car and made my way to the front door. Once inside, I began making my way through the entrance corridor. Only a couple of seconds had passed before I heard the sound of footsteps coming from my side. All of a sudden, from around the corner, came what looked to be a security guard. His hair was greasy, and his eyes were bloodshot. He spoke gruffly. Ah, you're John, right? The new mechanic, he said, and I found his voice familiar. Yeah, well, you sure have your work cut out for you. They're all in the back down the hall and to the left, he continued. Then he moved past me, slapping me on the back as he walked off nervously. I began to head towards the location given to me by the guard. As I walked through the carpeted halls, an air of nostalgia came over me. I used to be a fan of this place as a kid. Every Sunday, straight after sports practice, my father would take me here for lunch. He used to tell me that my mom would have loved to have been there too. She died giving birth to me, and the thought of it made my stomach churn. In almost no time, I had made it to a door labeled Restricted. I stared at it for a while, the red words seeming to be oozing off the door as if newly painted. I soon snapped out of it and finally pushed it open, making my way inside. The instant my body crossed over the doorway, I paused, my eyes suddenly filled with awe as I stood there trying to take in the countless animatronics all over the place. They weren't the main four, but they had the same feeling. The colossal pieces of mechanical genius stared back at me, their eyes lifeless and trying to regain focus. I decided it was time to get to work. The one closest to me resembled some kind of pink hippo holding a guitar, and I felt a little intimidated. I slowly crept over to it, carefully setting the toolbox down below it and peering inside its mouth, searching for the circuit board. I was surprised by how razor sharp the inside of it was, immediately imagining what would happen if someone were to get their hands stuck in it. It was a nasty, bloody image. As I looked around the mouth, I finally spotted the circuit board wedged 
all the way back at the entrance of the throat. To my surprise, I knew exactly which tool was needed to check it. I bent down to grab it, and that was the moment I heard the door behind me starting to creak open. I waited for a second, my eyes locked on the toolbox, making sure to keep my body angled so that I could see the door. My mind worked in total shock as I watched the security guard poke his head in, being careful not to move the door too much to remain hidden. His face had almost completely changed. His smile had disappeared, replaced by this horrific grin that practically screamed, I'm going to kill you. My skin crawled as I saw him move closer inside, still thinking I hadn't seen him. I could easily tell that he wanted to hurt me. To try and protect myself, I reached my hand into the toolbox, as if working as usual. Only this time, I was grabbing the screwdriver, just as my fingers gripped it. The hippo animatronic in front of me sprang to life, and the room was filled with bright, flashy colors alongside a song, being sung by the hippo himself at the same time. The guard suddenly launched himself in my direction, revealing a large hunting knife from behind his back. Without any hesitation, I responded by swiveling around, only to be hit in the face by one of the guard's knees, throwing me back onto the floor. The second I hit the ground, he threw his body on top of me with his knife at the ready. The screwdriver had already fallen out of my hands, but as he landed on my legs, I was able to throw him up into the air with one powerful kick fueled by adrenaline. Somehow, the force of the kick was so strong that he lifted straight up into the air, right as the hippo dislocated its mouth, trapping the guard's head with its metal jaws and beheading him. Shortly after, the corpse landed flat with a thud next to me. My eyes were wild with fear, not knowing what else to do. I chose to run away, hearing the sound of metal scraping against bone and flesh on my way out. As soon as I left the building, I called the police, and in under an hour, they arrived, carrying out an investigation all over the establishment. I heard back from them the very next day. The body was gone. There wasn't even any splatters of blood. The only thing out of place was the hippo animatronic. It had fallen over on its front. I also discovered that on the shift timetable, there was never even a guard shift that night because I was there to keep watch. My mind still struggles to understand who the freak was, how he got the guard uniform, and why he wanted to kill me. Most of all, why did the boss's voice sound so similar to his? I quit the day after, and I haven't gone back since. The moment I stepped back into my hometown, the air felt different, heavier, as if saturated with unspoken accusations and fear. My name is John, once just a common name, which had now become a synonym for something dark and sinister. Growing up, I was the nicest guy one could meet. And then, one day, I had joined the league of people like Ted Bundy and Ed Kemper. Netflix even did a popular true crime series about me some time back. I hadn't seen it, but I was told it became really popular. People on the streets in my hometown glanced my way with a mix of curiosity and fear. Mothers pulled their children close and whispers followed me like a shadow. The weight of my past was a tangible force pressing down on me, lurking within the pizzeria, drawing me back to confront the horrors of the past. The place was a decaying husk of its former self. The vibrant colors had faded, and the laughter that once filled the air was now just an echo in my mind. Shattered windows, covered in dust and grime, 
stared back at me like hollow eyes. The walls were canvases for strange graffiti symbols that seemed to hold some dark meaning I couldn't decipher. Pushing open the door, a chorus of creaks and groans greeted me, as if the building itself was lamenting its fate. The inside was a time capsule, a snapshot of the day my life changed forever. The sight of the main stage brought a rush of memories, each one a sharp jab to my heart. It was there, in the spotlight of joy and innocence, that a child's life had been tragically cut short, and I was there. I sat on the edge of the stage, the silence around me oppressive. The dust in the air danced in the slivers of light, piercing through the broken windows. In that solitude, a tear escaped, a silent testament to the injustice, to the years stolen from me and the innocent life lost. Exploring the pizzeria was like navigating through a haunted maze. Each corner held shadows of laughter and screams, each room a story untold. The animatronics, once the stars of the show, now stood as grotesque sentinels, their peeling paint and lifeless eyes, a mockery of their former glory. The silence was unnerving, filled with the whispers of a past that refused to die. In the depths of the security office, amidst a clutter of forgotten items, I found them. Old newspaper clippings, police reports, a dossier of the nightmare that enveloped my life. As I sifted through them, a horrifying picture began to emerge. The pieces of the puzzle were fitting together, revealing a truth more chilling than I had ever imagined. There were inconsistencies, unexplained phenomena, witnesses speaking of shadows and eerie voices. It wasn't just a murder. It was something beyond the realm of the living. But of course, no one believed. As darkness enveloped the pizzeria, its haunted nature became more pronounced. Lights flickered as if struggling to maintain their grip on reality. The whispers grew louder. A cacophony of voices that seemed to emanate from the walls, the ceiling, and the very air I breathed. And then I saw it. The animatronic seemed to twitch and move in the periphery of my vision. It was impossible. The place had been closed for decades. I had wondered if whatever sinister force was at play that night would still be lurking within the pizzeria. Movements jerky and unnatural as they advanced towards me. Their metal limbs creaking and worrying. I remembered the words of my bunkmate, the incantations he had taught me. My voice, steady despite the terror, filled the air with ancient chants, a language forgotten by time, but remembered by the dead. The pizzeria, now a battleground, echoed with the sinister laughter of the spirit. He was enjoying the challenge. All the other animatronics stirred to life as well. Their movements were jerky and unnatural as they advanced towards me their metal limbs creaking and worrying. I remembered the words of my bunkmate, the incantations he had taught me. My voice, steady despite the terror, filled the air with ancient chants, a language forgotten by time, but remembered by the dead. The pizzeria, now a battleground, echoed with the sinister laughter of the spirit. He was enjoying the challenge. All the other animatronics stirred to life as well, their movements jerky and unnatural as they advanced towards me, their metal limbs creaking and worrying. I remembered the words of my bunkmate, the incantations he had taught me. My voice, steady despite the terror, filled the air with ancient chants, a language forgotten by time but remembered by the dead. The pizzeria, now a battleground, echoed with the sinister laughter of the spirit. 
He was enjoying the challenge. All the other animatronics stirred to life as well, their movements jerky and unnatural as they advanced towards me, their metal limbs creaking and worrying. I remembered the words of my bunkmate, the incantations he had taught me. My voice, steady despite the terror, filled the air with ancient chants, a language forgotten by time, but remembered by the dead. The pizzeria now, a battleground, echoed with the sinister laughter of the spirit. He was enjoying the challenge. All the other animatronics stirred to life as well their movements jerky and unnatural as they advanced towards me, their metal limbs creaking and worrying. I lured the animatronics to the main stage, the heart of the pizzeria, and the epicenter of my sorrow. My time in prison had not just been spent on learning chants. I had also picked up a thing or two about electricity. In the days leading to this night, I had rigged the pizzeria's electrical system, turning the stage into a trap. The showdown was tense, a dance with death itself. The animatronics, their once joyful expressions now twisted into ghastly sneers, were relentless in their pursuit. I led them into the trap I had set, and as they converged on the main stage, I triggered the electrical surge. A blinding flash of light filled the pizzeria, followed by a deafening explosion of sparks and metal. The animatronics convulsed and twitched as electricity surged through their mechanical bodies. Freddy Fazbear, the animatronic that had haunted my nightmares, let out a deafening screech before falling to the ground, smoke rising from its charred remains. The other animatronics suffered a similar fate. Their mechanical bodies no match for the power of the surge. As the smoke cleared, the pizzeria fell silent once more. The sinister laughter of the spirit replaced by a heavy stillness. I had won, but at a great cost. The pizzeria, the place that had held so many painful memories, was now a smoldering ruin. I knew I could never return, and the weight of my past had grown even heavier. But at least I had confronted the horrors of my past and emerged victorious. As I left the decaying pizzeria behind, I couldn't help but wonder if the spirit that had tormented me for so long had finally found peace or if it would continue to haunt the decaying husk of Freddy Fazbear's pizzeria for all eternity. On the old memories and the horrors of the pizzeria, the night air felt different, lighter. The stars above shone a little brighter, a silent testament to the justice reclaimed. I walked away from the pizzeria, my steps unburdened. A man freed from the chains of an unjust past and a haunting present. The night embraced me, not as the Ripper, but as John, a man finally at peace. As I left the pizzeria behind, I couldn't help but reflect on the journey I had undertaken. From the nightmares of the past to the redemption of the present, I had faced my demons and emerged victorious, and now I could finally leave it all behind. The next part of the story seems to be a new beginning, as someone named Two felt different that night. Ralph's obsession with Five Nights at Freddy's had gone to a whole new level. While the rest of us were stressed out and tired from the special party, Ralph seemed more alive than ever. As we prepared to open to the public, Ralph insisted on staying dressed up as one of the animatronics from the game. He claimed it was for the kids and to make the restaurant more authentic, but there was something unsettling about the way he embraced the character. His eyes seemed unfocused and 
and his gaze was lost in their innocence. The children were having fun, but none of them paid attention to the fact that next to them, there was a terrifying face staring back at them. The night went on, and as the hours passed, Ralph's behavior became increasingly erratic. He would suddenly break into fits of maniacal laughter and mutter incomprehensible phrases under his breath. It was as if he had completely lost touch with reality. The other employees and I grew concerned, and we tried to talk to him, but he brushed us off, insisting that he was just having a great time. It was clear that something was seriously wrong, and I couldn't help but worry about my friend. As the night wore on, the atmosphere in the restaurant grew more and more tense. The children and their parents began to notice Ralph's strange behavior, and some of them left in a hurry. Clearly disturbed by the unsettling sight of the animatronic character that seemed to have come to life, I decided to confront Ralph, to try and snap him out of whatever trance he was in. But when I approached him, he turned to me with a wild look in his eyes, and his voice filled with a chilling malice. He spoke in a tone that sent shivers down my spine. Welcome to your nightmare, John, he said, his voice distorted and unnatural. It's time for round two. I stumbled back in horror, realizing that something had taken control of my friend, something dark and malevolent. Ralph's transformation into the character from the game was complete, and he had become a real-life nightmare. The restaurant descended into chaos as Ralph, or whatever had possessed him, began to terrorize the patrons and employees. The animatronics that had once been a source of joy and entertainment now moved with a sinister purpose. Their mechanical limbs lashing out at anyone who came too close. I knew I had to find a way to stop this madness, to save my friend and everyone else in the restaurant. But as I looked around at the nightmare unfolding before me, I couldn't help but wonder if we had all become pawns in a real life game of Five Nights at Freddy's, with no way out and no one coming to our rescue. The basement had become a nightmare I could hear the frantic mother upstairs, her voice growing more desperate as she searched for her missing son. I knew I had to find the boy and get out of there as quickly as possible. I walked cautiously through the dimly lit basement, straining to hear any sign of the child. Every creak of the floorboards seemed to echo loudly in the eerie silence. I called out the boy's name, hoping for a response there was only the oppressive stillness. Then the nightmare truly began. Someone else was down there with me. I heard slow, deliberate footsteps approaching. Each step sent a shiver down my spine, and my heart pounded in my chest. I couldn't see anything in the darkness, and my flashlight provided only a feeble beam of light. The footsteps drew closer, and I could sense a malevolent presence. Panic surged through me as the person reached the stairs leading back up. Closing the basement door behind them, the room plunged into darkness, and I was left alone with this ominous figure. In the pitch black basement, I could only hear the intruder's footsteps, one after another, drawing nearer. I had no idea who this person was or what they wanted very presence filled me with terror, rendering me immobile. Suddenly, dim lights flickered to life, revealing the intruder's identity. It was Ralph, but he was no longer the friend I had known. His face was red and bruised, his smile obsessive, and his eyes were lost in madness. Ralph was completely unhinged, and it sent a chill down my spine. I tried to reason with him, to snap him out of whatever delusion had taken hold of him. I asked him about his medication, but
but he brushed it off, convinced that the restaurant had been speaking to him and guiding his actions. Ralph revealed that he had the missing child and that he intended to recreate the infamous Bite of 87 incident. It was clear that he had lost touch with reality and I knew I had to stop him. I pleaded with him to take his medication, to come back to his senses, but he seemed beyond reason. Suddenly, the lights went out again, and I could hear his footsteps in the darkness. The footsteps were no longer following any pattern. They were surrounding me, closing in. In the complete darkness, I could feel Ralph's heavy breathing, and fear coursed through me. I was trapped in the basement with a friend who had become a nightmarish stranger, and I had no idea how to escape this terrifying situation. In shock and disbelief over his sudden descent into madness, they had noticed his erratic behavior, but had no idea it would escalate to such a terrifying extent. Ralph was taken into custody and placed under psychiatric evaluation and it was clear that he needed serious medical help. As for the restaurant, it was shut down indefinitely due to the traumatic events that had taken place. The once cheerful and nostalgic establishment had become a place of nightmares, and no one wanted to set foot inside its doors again. I couldn't help but feel a deep sadness for what had happened to Ralph, my childhood friend. His obsession with Five Nights at Freddy's had taken a dark and dangerous turn, and it had nearly cost the life of an innocent child. The incident haunted me for a long time, and I couldn't shake the feeling that the restaurant itself had played a role in Ralph's descent into madness. The dark history of Freddy Fazbear's pizzeria seemed to have seeped into the very walls of the place, and it had a way of twisting the minds of those who entered. I hoped that Ralph would eventually receive the help he needed and find his way back to sanity, but the memory of that night, of the darkness that had taken hold of my friend, would stay with me forever. A chilling reminder of the horrors that could lurk in the most unexpected places. I'm truly sorry to hear about the tragic turn of events involving your friend Ralph and his family. It's a heartbreaking situation, and it highlights the importance of seeking professional help and adhering to prescribed medication for individuals dealing with mental health issues. It's completely understandable that you would want to avoid the restaurant and anything associated with those painful memories. Traumatic experiences can have a lasting impact, and it's essential to prioritize your own well-being and mental health. If you ever find yourself struggling with the memories or emotions tied to this incident, consider seeking support from a mental health professional or confiding in someone you trust. Talking about your feelings and experiences can be a crucial step in processing and healing from traumatic events. Remember that your decision to avoid certain places or triggers is a valid and healthy way to protect yourself and maintain your peace of mind. It's essential to prioritize self-care and do what feels right for your mental and emotional well-being. 